Hello. As we begin the second half of the semester, we're going to talk about stuff that's really easy. You'll see, and you'll like it. It's a nice break from the hard stuff. All right, we're going to talk about polynomial end behavior. Now, I don't know if you've ever wondered what happens beyond the graph we usually look at. Usually we look um, at the middle part of the graph, the part of the graph that's centered here at zero, zero. But what happens way out at or close to infinity, whatever infinity may be, and close to negative infinity? What happens way out here and way out here? Way out here and way out here. That's what we're going to be talking about. End behavior is what happens way out here. And as it so happens, there are rules that cover that. And I don't know why there should be rules. You wouldn't think there would be, but there are. Here's a graph of y equals x squared in its home position. Any polynomial of even degree, that is x to the fourth, x to the sixth, let's write some of that down, x to the fourth, x to the sixth, x to the eighth, those are called even degrees. Well, any polynomial of even degree and with a positive um, leading coefficient, not just one, could be positive 54, but positive. So any polynomial with uh, any polynomial of even degree with a positive leading coefficient will go up on the right and up on the left. Now they'll look different maybe in the middle, but at the ends, they'll go up on the right and up on the left forever and ever. Any polynomial of even degree, that is x to the fourth, x to the sixth, x to the eighth, x to the tenth, and so on, that has a negative leading coefficient like negative one, or negative two, or negative three, or negative four, or negative 532, whatever. Any polynomial of even degree that has a leading coefficient that's negative will go down on the left and down on the right, just like negative x squared. It won't look like, maybe it won't look like negative x squared. It may be doing all sorts of weird stuff in the middle, but out on the ends, it will go down on the left and down on the right, guaranteed. Now, what about odd degree? Odd degree. Odd degree. Is like X to the one. X to the third. X to the fifth. X to the seventh. And so on. With a positive leading coefficient. is guaranteed to go up on the right and down on the left, just like the graph of x to the third, y equals x to the third. Now, it may do all sorts of strange stuff in the middle, but it's guaranteed. If the number in front of x to the third is positive, well, yeah, if the coefficient, the leading coefficient of the odd degree polynomial is positive, 
then you will have this going on out at the ends, not in the middle, maybe, but out at the ends. And then if, now what did I put that there for? That's silly. Well, let's, let's just mark it out. There. Negative, if y equals negative x to the third. Or negative x to the fifth. Or negative x to the one or negative x to the 17th. Any, any odd degree polynomial with a negative leading coefficient is going to look like y equals negative x to the third. That is way out at the ends, it'll go up on the left and down on the right. Forever. Guaranteed. So let us look at some of your homework problems. You're being asked to choose the end behavior of this polynomial. Ah, and look at that ugly leading coefficient. Doesn't matter if it's ugly or not. It's negative, and this is an odd degree polynomial. So we know immediately, we don't have to even stop and think up on the left, down on the right. Now down here, pi, yeah, it doesn't matter. This is x to the sixth, even degree, even degree. Negative, Leading coefficient. Down on the left, down on the right. What it's doing in the middle, I don't know or care for this particular question. Here's a trick question. They stuck the, uh, um, the leading term at the end, the highest degree term at the end. And notice it has a positive coefficient. It's going to look on the ends like y equals x to the third. That is up on the right, down on the left. That's all there is to this. Isn't that great? I think it's great. That was the easy stuff we're starting with. There's other easy stuff too. However, not everything can stay easy. We're being asked to find the zeros of the function and their multiplicities. Multiplicities are how many times the solutions occur, or how many times the zeros occur. Occurrence. I actually don't know, that might be an A. You check it out for me. Anyway, remember factoring by grouping. That's what I did here because you can. And I set it equal to zero because that's the way you find zeros. This is the function. I make it into a higher order equation and solve for X. So I group the first two terms and I group the second two terms, and I make sure I have a plus in the middle. Now, in the first set of parentheses, I have a common factor, a, a greatest common factor, x squared. I pull that out to the front. I'm left with leftovers, x minus four because I dragged out the GCF. Boom, boom. Over here, we have a rule. We have a rule that makes things a little bit harder. When the leading coefficient is negative, the GCF has to be negative. Clue 
clearly the GCF is going to be negative one. So I have to find a negative one in positive four. But positive four equals negative one times negative four. So now I know that both terms have a negative one. That's the GCF. I pull negative one out to the front and then it's gone. And I'm left with the leftovers X plus a negative four, which is minus four. So this is what I've got now. Look at this. Now my GCF is X minus four. It occurs in both of these terms, which are separated by a plus sign, the way it should be. I pull the GCF X minus four out to the front, and then I write the leftovers, X squared plus a negative one, which is X squared minus one. X squared minus one factors by the difference of two squares, X plus one and X minus one. So when I'm solving a higher order equation, I use the same method I use as when I'm solving a quadratic equation by factoring. I set each factor equal to zero. And I solve for X. So I get X equals four, X equals negative one, and X equals positive one. And each one of these occurs once. So here's a zero, and it has multiplicity one. Here's a zero, and it has multiplicity one. Here's a zero, and it has multiplicity one. If we were being asked for the x-intercepts, we're not. But if we were being asked for the x-intercepts, they would be four zero, negative one zero, and one zero. Remember that that's the relationship of zeros to x-intercepts when the zeros are real. And sometimes they're not. And then you don't have any x-intercepts. Imagine that. Actually, you can also have a mixture of real zeros and um, uh, complex conjugate zeros. As you know, you're already experts on that. Now this little bugger, we're gonna have to factor with U substitution. Because four is two times two, I can do that. I let u equal x squared, and then u squared equals x squared squared, which is x to the fourth. And that lets me temporarily change this to a quadratic equation, which I can solve by factoring. How do I know that? Well, I know that 50 equals 25 times two, and that 25 plus two is positive 27. But we are looking for negative 27. Oops, that's not gonna help. However, every positive number equals a negative number times a positive, uh, times a, every positive number, every positive real number equals um, a negative number times a negative number. So 
positive 50 equals negative 25 times negative 2. And when I add negative 25 to negative 2, I get negative 27. Ta-da! I can factor this into u minus 2 times u minus 25. Then I set u minus 2 and u minus 25 to 0 and solve for u, not x, for u. And I find out that u equals 2 and u equals 25. Well, u is really x squared though, so I have to resubstitute. x squared equals 2 and x squared equals 25. So the square root of x squared, I have to take the square root of both sides to get x, but I have to take the square root of two and put a plus or minus in front of it because every real, every positive real number equals two square roots, a positive square root and a negative square root. Oh, thank goodness for the stuff you learned in intermediate algebra. So our answers, our solutions to this equation, which are the zeros of the function, are negative the square root of two, positive the square root of two, negative five and positive five, because the square root of 25 is five, but I have a plus or minus in front of it. Each one of these occurs once, so the multiplicity is one. The multiplicity is one. The multiplicity is one. The multiplicity is one. Most of the time, but not all of the time, the multiplicity of your zeros will be one. Okay. We are about to do something else that's pretty darn easy. Enjoy it while it lasts, because things are gonna get harder. We're going to be looking at or continuing to look at the overwhelming importance of the leading term. Look at all the stuff the leading term is responsible for that we've already studied, and now we're going to look at something else. Here we're about to do something that is truly easy even if that's not very pretty. We're going to be looking at how important the degree is of the leading term. That six determines the maximum number of real zeros you can have, the maximum number of x-intercepts you can have, because of course these are very closely related, zeros and x-intercepts and the maximum number of turning points, which is what these ugly little things are, is five. Maximum means the most, or the largest number, so the most real zeros you can have is six. You can have fewer, but not more. The most x-intercepts you can have is six. You can have fewer, but not more. And the most number of turning points you can have is five. Why a turning point? Because this is decreasing, turns to increasing, turns to decreasing, turns to increasing, turns to decreasing, turns to increasing. Okay. Now, Here's a polynomial that begins with x to the ninth. So the maximum number of x of, of, of x intercepts you can have is nine. 
the maximum number of real zeros you can have is nine, and the maximum number of turning points you can have is one less than the degree of the leading term, which is eight. You can have fewer, but you can't have more. Here the leading term is on the end. It's the highest degree term. We don't care about the sign in front this time. All we're caring about is the degree. The maximum number of real zeros you can have is five. The maximum number of X intercepts you can have is five. And the maximum number of turning points you can have is four. Okay. So let me let me try to draw this. OK, no, I'm not going to. It would be a disaster kind of like that. We'll let you do it. Now, with all of this knowledge that you have accrued, we're going to have to choose the correct graph. Here we have a function, f of x equals one third x squared minus two. And it says use the leading term test and the knowledge of y intercepts to match the function with one of the graphs below. Well, we have a positive leading coefficient and an even degree that means the graph is going to go up on the left and up on the right. And the y-intercept is negative 2, which is officially written as parenthesis 0, comma, negative 2, parenthesis. That sure looks like a negative 2 to me. So this is our graph. This would be the graph of an odd degree polynomial that has a negative leading coefficient, not what we're looking for. Okay, here we have X to the fifth as our leading term, positive leading coefficient and 10 is the y-intercept, otherwise known as 0, 10. So that means we're looking for a graph that goes up on the right and down on the left. That could only be this one. But as an uh, extra check, we see that 10 is the y-intercept. Now it looks like a 1. What do you mean 10? Well, that's where this helps you. This tells you all about the X and the Y axis. Kind of like the, um, um, kind of like on a map. Okay, the, the word is, is right on the tip of my tongue. I'll think of it. The legend, the legend on a map gives you all the information about the map and about the measurement on the map. Well, that's what this does. This is like the legend of these graphs. The x-axis goes from negative five to positive five. The y-axis, ooh, goes from negative 50 to positive 50. But it looks like negative five to five. Why? Well, jump over here to y scale, and it tells you that you have 10 little invisible scale marks between each of the big scale marks. So this isn't one, two, three, four, five. This is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And negative 10, negative 20, negative 30, negative 40, negative 50. Our legend here can tell you all about it. Now, here we have f of x equals x to the fourth minus 2x to the third plus 10x squared plus x minus 16. All we're looking at is the degree of the leading term. It's even. Goes up on the left, up on the right. 
and the y-intercept is negative 16. We have two graphs that go up on the left and up on the right. So the determiner of our answer is going to be the y-intercept. Here we have negative 10, negative 20, and negative 30. Look at this, this graph has a y-intercept between zero and negative 10. But this graph has a y-intercept between negative 10 and negative 20. This is most likely to be the correct graph. It goes up on the left, up on the right, and the y-intercept looks like it could be correct. There you go. This is our answer right here. Okay, go back and look through all of this. And I'll talk to you soon with some harder stuff. Bye-bye.